Well, ha having seen a number of the concepts that relate to relational database, we're now going to look at some of the tables that we'll be using throughout the remainder of the course. And this is what I'm calling my academic database. There are about eight or so tables here. When we design a database, that is, when we do what's called data modeling, we capture information about the world we are modeling and then use that information to develop semantically correct data definition statements to implement our design. So the discussion of the examples given here will provide some insight into the type of information that must be gathered and understood during the data modeling process. So we talk about the acad academic database. As I said, it's simply a handful of tables that I've created. They're not very large, but they're going to serve to allow us to illustrate a number of the important concepts that we've been talking about and some additional concepts later in the course. So these slides are going to show you the structure and the content of a rather small database, but there are some, there are some complexity and subtlety within it nonetheless. So the information presented here will explain how the tables are actually defined to the database. This is kind of like the, the step that follows the data modeling process. We've now decided what the table should be. Let's go ahead and define them to the database. So the statements that we're going to present will illustrate concepts of primary key and foreign key. We've already seen some of that, but we're going to go into more detail with our examples. And additional constraints such as check, unique, and not null. Not null is really just a special form of the check constraint. Now we make the following observations about the sample database that we're going to be presented. The primary keys are unique and not null. That holds for everything that is considered a primary key. Foreign key values must match primary key values. Again, that's the concept of referential integrity that we explained earlier. The check and unique constraints apply business rules from the application domain, the world that we were modeling. So here's some data definition statements for a few of the tables. We start off by looking at a table called the department table. Each row in the department table is going to define one administrative unit at the school. The primary key or the unique identifier is DEPT. That would be the name of the department. We also have information about where that department is located on campus, the building in the room. And there's an additional column here that identifies the faculty number who serves as the chairperson of that particular department. Now this table, as we see, has a primary key, which is atomic, single column. Likewise, the course table has a primary key, which is atomic, again, a single column. Each row in the course table identifies a single course offered at this particular school. CNO, the course number, is the primary key. We have the name of the course, and we say that's required, not null. The description, every course must have a description, that's not null. These are also characters, but notice the difference here is CNO is fixed length, C name and C description are variable length. We have the credit awarded to a student for completing the course. That's simply an integer. We have the lab fee, how much we charge the, charge the student for attending a class on this particular course. And that's a decimal, five positions, two of which follow the decimal point. We also have the C department column here, in here, which is required, but the significant point of this is it references the department table, DEPT. So what is C department? It's a foreign key. Every department may be responsible for or sponsor many different courses. A given course is sponsored by exactly one department. This is how we're establishing the relationship between course and department. Additionally, we have another integrity constraint mentioned toward the bottom here that says that the, la that the credit must be a value of one, three, and six. We don't have any two credit courses, four credit courses. We only have one, three, and six credit courses. The class table. Each row in the class table 
represents a single scheduled offering of a course. So therefore, there's, a, there's an association or relationship between course and class. Each course is identified by CNO, as we saw in the course table. Here, CNO is used as part of the primary key. We have a composite primary key. It's the combination of course number and section number that taken together will uniquely identify one class or one row in the class table. But course number, when taken by itself, serves as a foreign key to identify the course for which this is a scheduled offering. And notice the delete rule says on delete restrict. If we were to suddenly remove a course from the catalog, hence a course from the course table, a row from the course table, all classes that are scheduled on it would automatically be removed as well because of a cascading delete for our delete rule for referential integrity. We go a little bit further and we have the CIN STR FNO column, which is the class instructor faculty number. This column identifies a row in the faculty table where that faculty member serves as the instructor for the class. So another foreign key. And then we have several other columns here which determine the when and where for the class. When is it going to be presented? What's the schedule? Where will it be delivered? What's the building and room? So you can see nothing in the class table tells you about the number of credits or the lab fee or even the name of the course. That information can be obtained by using this relationship between class and course. This simply has date, time information, location information about where the class will be delivered. But in terms of what the class is going to cover, what department is responsible, we, that describes the course and we have to go back to the course table. That's where the foreign key comes into play. So the class table has a composite primary key, not atomic like we saw in the other table. We're using a little bit different syntax here. See, we couldn't really say course number, primary key, class or section number, primary key. That would suggest that we're trying to define two different primary keys. So instead of using that constraint for primary key right here at the column level, we added it at the conclusion of the description of the table. And that's because it's a composite. It consists of multiple columns. Kind of a requirement here to do it that way. The faculty table. Each row in the faculty table represents one faculty member who works at the school. The faculty member is uniquely identified by a faculty number. Each faculty member must have a name. We have an address, the date of hire, the number of dependents, the salary, and then we have a foreign key here that says F department references the primary key of the department table. Remember the relationship here is each department employs many faculty. A given faculty is employed by one department. So that's why we have the foreign key here to capture that relationship. Additionally, we chose to say that the faculty name must be unique. You cannot have two faculty with the same name. We didn't put the constraint on the column. We added it down here at the end of the declaration of the table. Student. Each row in the student table represents information about one student who's enrolled at the school. Each student is identified by a unique student number. Each student has a name, must have a name, and then also can have an address, phone number, date of birth. We have the IQ of the student, and we have the faculty advisor. This is a foreign key. Each faculty member may advise many different students, but a given student is advised by exactly one faculty member. So this identifies the faculty advisor, a row in the faculty table, for this particular student. Additionally, each student has to declare a major. We say in our database that a major is equivalent to or synonymous with a department. So you major in CIS or you major in philosophy. So the major column is also a foreign key. Notice this one says not null, it's required. 
student advisor faculty number did not state not null, so it's possible that a student may not at some point in time be assigned a faculty advisor, but they must declare a major. That major is a row in the department table, and we have the foreign key to capture that relationship. Registration. This is an interesting table because what we have is kind of an intersection between student and class. A given student may register for many different classes, and a given class may have many different students who register for it. So to uniquely identify one row in a registration table, we need to take into account three different columns. Tell me the course number and the section number and the student number, and that will uniquely identify one row in this table. The remaining data bearing column in here is the registration date. When did the registration event take place? That's the date data type. Now, we have two foreign keys, because remember the registration event relates to a student and relates to a class. SNO, part of the primary key, but when taken by itself, refers to a row in the student table to identify the student who has participated in this registration event. Additionally, the combination of course number and section number, also part of the primary key, forms a composite foreign key to identify the class for which this particular student or this particular event was associated. So notice we have a three column composite primary key and we have a two column composite foreign key. Remember the number of columns in the class table for its primary key is two, so therefore we must have two corresponding columns for the foreign key to capture the relationship. The staff table. Each row in the staff table represents one employee. This type of employee does not teach classes. Faculty teach classes. This type of employee does not advise students. Faculty advise students. These are administrative folks who work at the school. Each faculty member was identified by a faculty number. Each staff member is identified by their name, the e-name column. Kind of odd we say that's the primary key. What does that mean? Well, it means that no two staff can have the same name. Okay, but it also means this is going to be not null. That's implied because it's a primary key. Each staff member has a job title and has a salary and is associated with some department. But notice when we get to department, we don't say anything about a reference. Department is not a foreign key. So the DEPT column is not a foreign key from staff to the department table. What this means is if you look at the DEPT column, structurally it looks the same as the primary key of the department table, var char length of four. That is essentially a coincidence. There's no requirement that it be exactly the same because there's no referential integrity in play here. So this is kind of an odd table, but we did this intentionally so we can illustrate some very important concepts when it comes time to work with SQL and manipulate and access some of the data. We do have one integrity constraint here. The salary of a staff member must fall between 49 and 26,000. Really not a place you really want to get a job at if, if they can only pay you $49. But anyway, that's a constraint that's uh, applied to this particular table. So we've mentioned these observations already. Here they are once again. Primary keys are unique and not null. Foreign keys have to match primary keys. We also have check and unique constraint, which serve to apply some of the business rules from the application domain. We're using constraints, part of the data definition statements, so this is referred to as declarative integrity. This particular database currently has no database triggers, which means procedural integrity does not apply to this particular database, at least at the moment. So let's look at the content of some of these tables. The department table, here's the primary key. No two rows have the same value in the DEPT column. 
Each department is located in a building and a specific room within that building and is chaired by a particular faculty member. Notice at the moment, management does not have a chair. There's a vacancy there. The rooms, again, in any table are returned to us in no particular order if we simply say, show me the rows. For example, select asterisk from department. The left to right order corresponds to the order in which the columns were assigned in the create table statement. So here to get this data, I did a query such as select asterisk all of the columns from department, and I had no where clause. Asterisk gave me all of the columns in the same left to right order that was established when the table was created. Here's course. This is our largest table. It has six columns and 14 rows. Notice the C department column has values that we saw in the department table. It must because C department is defined as a foreign key. So we have theology, philosophy, CIS. Those are the uh, only values that we see here. Management is another possibility, but currently management doesn't sponsor any courses. We also have CNO, which is the primary key, and you can scan the data as shown here and verify that there are no duplicates. And then we have a brief description, brief course name, the number of credits in the lab fee, two numeric columns. Class. Each class represents a scheduled offering of some course. The course is identified in CNO. The class is uniquely identified by using a combination of the course number and a section number. Notice that the course number by itself does not uniquely identify a row. We have multiple courses for C11, multiple courses for T11. And section number by itself does not uniquely identify a row. Multiple instances of 01, multiple instances of 02. And once again, we've got some information about where and when the class will be delivered. Then we have the faculty table. With the faculty table, we have FNO as a primary key. And again, that's a unique identifier. We have a date for the hire date, an integer for the number of dependents. We have a decimal for the salary. And then F department is a foreign key. And you can validate that here, seeing that we have only values of CIS theology philosophy. We have nothing outside of the values shown in the department table. And then we have the student table. SNO is the primary key. And then we have the name, address, phone number, birth date. Notice this is not a date data type. This is simply a character string. This is kind of an older way that people chose to represent date time data by using character strings. Uh, we should really be using date time data types but we wanted to show a variety of different techniques here within our database. Uh, we also have uh, the IQ, which is an integer, and then we have the student advisor faculty member. Recall this is a foreign key that identifies a row in the faculty table. Student major identifies a row in the department table. Registration. Remember this was an intersection between class and student. And we can see class data here, the combination of course number, section number, and we can see student data. What's interesting to note is something like C1101 appears multiple times, but each time it appears with a different student number. Likewise, we might have student number 800 appear multiple times, but each time you see student number 800, you see a different combination of course number, section number associated with that student. And that's a necessity because, again, the three columns when taken together must be a unique combination of values. It serves as the primary key. Then the staff table that we mentioned previously has ename as the primary key, and you can confirm that no two employees have the same name. And here, as we examine the department column, notice we have Euclid, who is assigned to math, Archimedes, who is assigned to engineering. Those two departments do not exist within the department table, but that's not a problem because we don't have referential integrity enforced here. It's just a coincidence that the values look similar and the column name is the same and the description is the same. 
Here's a brief description to summarize our tables. We have each table name outside of parentheses and within parentheses. We give a comma separated list of the columns. The notation we use is somewhat standardized. Uh, we underline the primary key, and if there are multiple columns, all of the columns that constitute or comprise the primary key will be underlined. As a little exercise, consider what the foreign keys are, kind of review what we went through, and take the foreign keys and underline them. And the way we would underline them is kind of a dashed or broken underline, so they don't appear to be part of the primary key. So I'll leave that as an exercise for you. You can pause the video, go back and forth, uh, just to ensure you have an understanding of that. Now that we've described the structure of the tables and examined the data definition statements, and also had a taste for some of the data stored within these tables, let's take a closer look and examine the relationships. There are a couple special relationships that we want to note, and then we'll summarize all of the relationships. First, there's a many-to-many -many relationship that exists between student and class. And this is captured in a table called registration. Each row in a registration table reflects one registration event. That is, a single student registering for some single class. But the idea here is that a given student potentially can register for many different classes. So therefore, the student number of some particular student may appear in more than one row in the registration table. But each time that it appears, it will appear with a different class. Similarly, each class will have many students who register for that class. Hence, the class identifier will also appear many times. That is, it'll be present in more than one row within the table. But each time it appears, it will also be associated with a different student number. So the idea is to uniquely identify one row in the registration table or a single registration event, we'll need to take a combination of the identifier for the student and the identifier for the class. So the primary key will consist of the student identifier plus the class identifier. That combination in some way will serve to uniquely identify one registration event, hence one row in the registration table. Now, each registration event is recorded as a row in the registration table. We talked about how to identify that row or that event, event in terms of a primary key, but there's more that comes out of this. What happens is the row has to refer back to the student who is involved in the registration event. So we must clearly identify a valid or existing student. So we need a foreign key from the row in registration to a row in the student table. Additionally, each row representing a single registration event has to somehow make a reference to or refer back to or identify the class that was involved in that event. So we need a second foreign key from each row in the registration table back to the class table. Now we've taken a look at that as we looked at the structure of the create tables statement, but this is a little bit more of an explanation of why we have a primary key that's composite, why we have multiple foreign keys, and so forth. There's a second very interesting relationship we want to address here, and this is a cyclic relationship that exists between faculty and department. Each department may have many faculty members assigned to that department, and every faculty member must be assigned to one department. So we have a one-to-many relationship between these two tables. So we will need a foreign key from faculty to department because department is the one in the one-to-many relationship and faculty is the many. So we put a foreign key in the many to identify the one that it is associated with. The foreign key here is F department. Each department also happens to be chaired or say managed by one faculty member. So 
what we have here is a case that a faculty member might manage a department, but it turns out that most faculty members do not participate in this relationship. But the relationship is one-to-one. -one. A given faculty member may chair one department. A department will be chaired by one faculty member. So we need a foreign key to capture this relationship. But where do we put it? Well, it makes sense to put the foreign key in the department table and refer to the faculty table. The reason for this is not every faculty member will chair a department. Most of them will not. But every department, unless there's some kind of a temporary vacancy, will identify some faculty member who currently serves as the chairperson of the department. So therefore, from a practical perspective, it makes more sense to put the foreign key in department and refer to faculty. Now, this is where the cycle comes in. We have a foreign key for the first relationship, the employee assigned to department relationship that refers from faculty to department. So that's the child to the parent. On the other hand, the roles are reversed. The department has the foreign key that refers to the faculty. So it's a, actually a cycle or a cyclic relationship. Very interesting. But it also means that when we access the two tables together, there are kind of two ways to connect the dots or two ways to express a relationship. If we use the relationship here of faculty being assigned to department, for each department that we identify, there will be many faculty rows. But if we use this other relationship of department chairperson, for each department we identify, there will be one faculty member. Very important to recognize that. Both ways are valid ways to relate the tables, but which one we use depends on the nature of the question that we're trying to answer. So we really need to understand this. This is part of the data semantics. Now to summarize all of the tables that we've just looked at, at primary keys and foreign keys, we wrap it up here. The department table has a primary key of DEPT. It also has a foreign key of DCHFNO, and this is due to that second relationship, the one-to-one -one relationship. So this will point to the faculty number of some row in the faculty table. <clears throat> course has a primary key of CNO, and a course is sponsored by a department. A department sponsors many courses. We have a foreign key of C department or CDEPT that refers to the primary key in the department table. Class is a scheduled offering of a course. So each course may have many scheduled offerings or many classes or may have none. But a class is always associated with exactly one course, another one to many relationship. The primary key here is a composite consisting of course number and section number. Course number taken by itself from within the class table serves as a foreign key to identify the row in the course table. Likewise, classes are taught by faculty members. So a faculty member is playing the role of being an instructor. So what we have is a column called CINSTRFNO, which refers from a row in class to a row in faculty to identify the faculty member who's teaching the course. Faculty, as we said, is a special kind of employee. We have a unique identifier for the faculty member in terms of faculty number, but faculty are associated with departments and exactly one department, and we have F department, that's the foreign key, mapping to a row in a department table. Students are identified by a unique student number, and students participate in two relationships. Each student majors in some department. So SMAJ is a foreign key referring back to the department table. Very interesting point here is the name of this column bears no resemblance whatsoever to the primary key to which it will make a reference. Names don't have to be the same, but remember data types and sizes must be identical. The second relationship where we have student involved, has SADVFNO, student advisor faculty number. Each student is advised by a faculty member, and a faculty member may advise many students. So we have a foreign key from student to faculty. And then the interesting one we talked about a moment ago, the many-to-many -many relationship that's captured by the registration table. 
three columns together form a composite primary key. Course number plus section number plus student number uniquely identify one row in the registration table, hence a single registration event. And then we have a composite foreign key. The two columns of course number and section number refer back to the class for which the event occurred. And student number taken by itself refers back to the student table to identify the student who participated in this particular registration event. And then the staff table has a primary key of E name. No two staff members can have the same name. There are no other relationships that involve the staff table. Now the purpose of this particular video was to give you an overview of the database that we're working with, just a small number of tables, because we're going to now introduce the complex SQL statements, multi-table operations. We'll be looking at joins, inner joins and outer joins, subqueries, non-correlated, correlated table expressions, and we'll also be looking at set operations, union, intersect, and the set difference operation. To understand semantically which tables will be necessary to be accessed to answer a particular question, you need to know these data semantics here, the relationships. And that's why we threw this little video in to give you that overview in preparation for understanding the multi-table operations that we're going to introduce in the next few videos. So I hope, hope you found this useful, even if you're not working with this database. Uh, hopefully you get an idea of some of the ways relationships can be captured within a relational database. And once again, if you found this to be useful, then please offer some comments, some feedback, or if you have any questions, uh, we'll gladly take a look at those and respond. And also consider subscribing to the channel uh, to express your interest or an appreciation for what we're doing. And again, subscribing is free. And once again, thanks for watching.